So we'll set our motivation. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May, May all sentient beings be, be, be free from, from suffering and the causes of suffering. suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from desire for friends and hatred for enemies. And just let that sink in for a moment. Let yourself connect. Love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And then refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange chudon soge chunam la Janchu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange Chudon soge chunam la Janchu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange churon sogi churam la chanchu paru dani kapsu chi dagi chun yengi pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho. Okay, so today we're going to look at ultimate bodhicitta, we're going to look at the wisdom realizing emptiness in the mind of someone who has bodhicitta. And the verses of this type are, I think, particularly evocative and uh, experiential and poetic and confusing. So let's look at them and then let's see what we think. Training in the ultimate awakening mind. <clears throat> it says, when stability has been attained, impart the secret teaching. Consider all phenomena as like dreams. Examine the nature of unborn awareness. The remedy itself is released in its own pace. Place the essence of the path on the nature of the basis of all. In between sessions, be a creator of illusions. So this training in the ultimate awakening mind, this is really what's going to be more than symptoms relief. This is what actually cuts the root of suffering. If we really want to cut the root of suffering, we need to understand what is keeping us bound first. So what keeps us bound in samsara is karma and disturbing emotions and Really, it's our responses and our reactions to suffering. So if we think about how much our responses and reactions to suffering lead to more suffering, already we're ahead of the game. Most people have their suffering and their reaction has a direct impact on just more of the same and more of the same and more of the same. If we have a tiny gap that says, all right, I'm struggling physically or mentally or situationally, I'm struggling. How can I respond in such a way where this seed finishes and I don't create any more? How do I respond in a different way? And most of the text is like reframing in a radical way. How to use suffering to open the heart of compassion, how to use suffering to understand the spectrum of the human existence, how to really get yourself the good kind open heart. And that just keeps a lid on your reactivity. It doesn't prevent your reactivity because you don't have the mindfulness to sustain it. Yeah, if you could stay in a positive state of mind all the time, you would never water negative seeds that would lead to suffering. And if you didn't have any suffering, you would be very well behaved, right? Most of our bad behavior, our irritability, our grumpiness, being blunt and curt and sharp with each other, our divisiveness, it comes from feeling unsettled in some way. If we never felt unsettled, if we were in a peaceful, spacious, happy, content place, 
we would be staying out of trouble, yes? <laughs> like it would be not particularly hard to be kind. Think of the reverse, when you're feeling very happy and content and benevolent, kindness flows quite easily. You can be polite to people, it's not a huge effort. You can be benevolent and altruistic and think of their welfare quite easily. So if it was just as simple as staying in a positive state of mind, that would be fantastic. But we, one, don't have the concentration and mindfulness to sustain it, nor do we have the background thoughts that keep it as a really important priority. We take our peace for granted when we experience peace. When we're in a positive state of mind, we don't think, how shall I maintain this positive state of mind through thinking of others? We just kind of relax and enjoy it and hope it lasts. Don't particularly think of sharing it unless we're a nice person and really actively have been in that headspace. But, you know, we're not really thinking about why did this happiness come about from a deep cosmic place. We think it's because people are being nice and getting along. It's because the weather is nice. It's because the food is good. And you're giving all the credit to these surface conditions and not to the substantial cause. So the main part of the text is really saying that whether happiness or suffering, you can use all of this as fuel for your path if you think and consider others. If you think and consider others in all of your actions, whether you're struggling or whether you're happy, that's going to help. And also it's not enough. What else do you need? You need to understand reality. You need to understand why we experience dualism. Why there is such a black and white sense of us and them, me and you, inside, outside. Why is there this dualism, this illusory nature to life? Because if there wasn't that, you wouldn't need all this mind training. If there wasn't this false appearance, we would live in a flow state and not cause any trouble ever, not hurt each other, not struggle. So there's this sort of twofold approach of how do you work with the fact that appearances are deceptive and how do you get rid of the deception? Yeah, you with me so far? So how do you work with the deceptive appearances? That's method, that's working with relative truth. And ultimate truth is the fact that things lack inherent existence. And we need the wisdom that realizes that. And we need it from a place of a good kind heart that wishes the welfare of others. So starting at the last part of the stanza, I think is quite interesting. In between sessions, be a creator of illusions. In between meditation sessions, be a creator of illusions. Most of our life is in between sessions, right? Most of our life is not in meditation. Yes. So most of our life, be a creator of illusions, is something for us to perk up and say, what does that mean? A creator of illusions. This makes it sound like you're making it worse, right? It's already illusory. You want to make it more illusory? No. It's saying acknowledge the dream to be a dream. And like when you acknowledge a dream to be a dream, you can be proactive in the dream state, like a lucid dream. Yeah, you know, when you're literally sleeping and you know that you're having a dream and suddenly there is control as opposed to so many dreams that you remember snippets and pieces of, and you were just kind of a victim of your own dream and you were just buffeted around by whatever pleasant or unpleasant or, un or neutral situation. But sometimes you have the good dream where you realize you're dreaming and then you create your dream. You know, a lucid dream. So what if you were to live your life as if you were in a lucid dream? What if you were to live your life and say, everything that appears to me is a projection. Everything that appears to me is a projection of my own mind, which is under the influence of this innate ignorance. So how do I play with the projection in a way that leads me through to pierce through it? How do I wake myself up out of this dream? First, I need to play with the dream differently. See the dream as a dream. 
And so being a creator of illusions, it's more empowered to think that way than to think that you're literally in control of your life because you're only in control of a certain few pieces. Yeah. You're sort of in control of your own mood. You're sort of in control of your own house and landscape, sort of, but you're also influenced. If you think in between sessions, be a creator of illusions, sometimes the translators say, be a child of illusions. Some of you might have read that translation, in between sessions, be a child of illusions, which has a slightly different connotation, like it's playful and it's curious, playful and curious in your dream life. And so to say that your life is like a dream isn't to say it's not real in some sense. It's just that there's a characteristic to everything in our life, which is an illusion. And if we never acknowledge that, we'll never break the spell. So walking around, looking at life like this is a projection, that's a projection. You don't have to go all the way. You can just go a few steps in and it starts really helping. So if I look out the window and I see trees, I'm not thinking the trees are an illusion. You don't have to go that far, but you can think my opinion of the trees as being too close or too far, too spacious, too, too I don't know, wild, the too much or the not enough on top of trees is too much. That's my projection. And my projection is based on opinions I've come to through my lifetime. So if I think the trees are too close, it might be because I experienced a bushfire. Or if I think the trees are too close, it might be because I accurately see too much undergrowth. And you don't have to get rid of opinions like that. What you're trying to do is to say, that is not inherently true from its own side, that this equals good and this equals bad. Because even if my house burned down, it might not be a bad thing. Yeah, it's only good or bad from a certain perspective. That Buddhist philosophy is not so coarse as a basic idea of reframing. And it's also not going all the way to the edge into nihilism or eternalism, because can you see the danger in thinking that nothing inherently exists? What if you were to say, if good is bad and bad is good, then what is the need for ethics? Right. And that would be going too far. That would be a misunderstanding of these teachings. You know, so so it's such a razor's edge. Do you understand? Right. This razor's edge where you're saying there is an appearance and I need to live in some sort of synchronicity with this appearance while acknowledging it's illusory. And the illusion is things appear to inherently exist when the opposite is the case, they lack inherent existence, which is not to say they don't exist at all. So if you're just walking around, you know, thinking that you're a child of illusions or a creator of illusions, what you're really saying to yourself is there is possibility here. There is a different possibility here than what my habits dictate. There is more to this story than what my neural pathways can process. There is more here. And because there's more here, there is more possibility and potentiality than I realized here, which means there is more change available to me if I engage with it. But we're just so used to finding patterns to be efficient, to save time, to get used to life, that we don't often take a step back and say, is there another way to look at this? And if I look at it differently, will I behave differently? And if I behave differently, will I feel differently? And if I feel differently, will I interact with people differently? And would any of that be positive? <laughs> yes, <laughs> lots of it would be. But we get trapped in our patterns and our habits. And we say, this is the way it is. This is the way it has always been. And these are things I can be certain of. And even if I don't like them, I'm not going to widen my perspective because that is scary. Better the annoying that I know than the grand possibility that I haven't touched yet. 
this is how we get, right? We get stuck in our habit cycles. And so if you can use a slogan like this to just kind of start cracking or ruining the momentum of the wheel of your life in such a way that it could take another route and that that route could be of more benefit to yourself and others. And so you just use the various reasonings in Buddhist philosophy, but you don't have to use all of them and make yourself overwhelmed. And the simplest and profound one is everything is empty because it's dependent. Because it's dependent. Because it does not stand alone. And if you think about that in a number of contexts, you start holding your opinions more lightly. You start being less reactive and peace is accessible to you much more easily. And of course, on top of all of that is you don't create so much negative karma. You don't have so many bad days. You don't make so many mistakes, etc., etc. But it's really fascinating to start just having thought projects, not even sitting in meditation, just thought projects where you say, what is something I am sure is good? What is something I am sure is bad? And how can I see that it does not exist in the way it appears, but maybe still hold that opinion lightly? You know, think about somebody that triggers you like some politician that you really think is terrible and evil. Some terrible evil politician, I'm sure we can think of one, right, in the whole world if we read the news at any point in the last five to ten decades, right? We will have found someone that annoys us. So you think of political figure A, and you think, all right, so they are bad, inherently bad. From their own side, bad. Bad policies, bad person, bad everything, bad father, bad whatever, you know, bad. And you're like, all right, so what is the criteria for bad? Okay, maybe it's valid criteria, like they did unethical things, they did harmful things, they behaved badly towards others, they were an active agent of harm and chaos in the world. Bad. All right, so bad from whose perspective? Yeah, and that's where it starts to get a little bit softer, where you, you can still hold the, these actions were unethical, and also towards this set of people, there was benefit. And in this larger context of history, it showed us something about ourselves as a society that we needed to wake up to, for example, right? So you, you can take it from any number of directions, but you can say, all right, this person with their bad motivations and their harmful actions, this person is not exactly as they seem to be because someone over here really finds them their advocate thinks of them as their supporter and their protector. And also in the grand spectrum of history, we might come to seize them as someone very important in the timeline because they pointed to a problem in various, you know, I don't know, government climates in various, I don't know, <laughs> policy behaviors, something intrinsic in society that got really stuck and stifled and that we might not have noticed how bad it had gotten unless we had someone loud saying it often. Did I lose you? So bad from what perspective? You know, bad from a perspective. But as soon as you start looking at other perspectives, you can still circle back to, but I'm not voting for them. And that is completely fine. But the attitude from which you're not voting for them is not anger and reactivity, which is actually making you closer to that very thing that you hate. And that is really the spiritual path. You can set boundaries, you can say no, you can be assertive, but you're coming at it from a place that is not making things worse. And if you're meeting anger with anger, or you're meeting greed with miserliness, or you're having this kind of reaction, you're actually not helping things, you're making them worse. And yet it almost feels like you have a moral obligation to be angry when someone does something wrong. It feels like you're supposed to be angry in response to people's bad behavior. But again, really? Inherently? Necessary? And you take a step back and you go, well, what do I want? 
I want for them to stop that. What is the best strategy to get this person to stop that? Is it being domineering? Is it making them feel stupid? Is it undermining their authority? Maybe in some contexts, but what does that lead to? But more reactivity and more of the same, and it's the same story with different faces. Yeah. Then you get even more close to the bone and say, what makes me change? Have I ever changed? <laughs> what makes me as an individual ever do something differently? Have I ever changed a habit or a pattern? It's a little confronting because sometimes you sit long enough and you're like, gee, I have been like this for quite some time. <laughs> right? But every once in a while, a friend or a family member will say, I love you very much. You should know that when you speak to people this way, it really hurts them. And you at first are defensive and full of excuses and explaining why you say what you say and how you didn't mean it the way it landed and you, you know, running around your ham hamster wheel. But then you might reflect and say, oh, that landed painfully. What I did, what I said, how I was hurt people. I don't want to hurt people. Maybe I'll change. You had a little moment of truth, right? Where there was a window for you to consider that perhaps the problem was you. <laughs> it does not often occur to us that the problem is us. But if you can think of any situation in your life where you had a real moment of self-awareness about your own problematic behavior, what was the conditions around it? So many different things. But probably the conditions weren't being backed into a corner and being shamed. That can lead to a change of behavior, but it's the change of behavior that has a whip, you know, some sort of ricochet effect or some sort of a rebellion along the line, right? If you suppress things or deny things, they're going to bubble up in other ways. That's not what we're talking about. But when there's been a genuine heart connection with another human being where you feel safe enough to say, yes, I was wrong, and you know they will still accept you. Okay, so you made, you made it personal, now you can make it political again, or now you can make it interpersonal again. But this is the thing with the Dharma, is you have to keep playing with, what did I think was going to happen? Where do my projections come from? Why do I feel these assumptions are so true? And be able to explore there is more to the story. This is an illusion. And the illusion is it seems just as it is. No, no bigger picture than what I can see. And if you think there is no picture bigger than what you can see, you will never see any bigger picture. So just considering that there might be more to the story gives you a little bit of a chance to see more to the story. It's an interesting one, this, this way of, of playing with the ultimate awakening mind to think about being the creator of illusions. But another one is, yeah, consider all phenomena as like dreams. This one, the remedy itself, is released in its own place. This one is the very empowering one. Because if you get a little bit of an understanding of emptiness, the emptiness of inherent existence, then that colors the way you view life. And then the remedy to the problem is released right in the very place where the problem occurred, which is your mind. The remedy is released in its own place. For example, you're having an argument with someone, you're really certain that you're right and they're wrong, and you're having that tug of war energetically and verbally. And just you saying to yourself, there is more to the story than mine and theirs. There is more to the story than what I can perceive. The way I'm viewing this is dependently arisen. Just a few thoughts in your head, just a few seconds, and the remedy to your anger is released right there. Your anger loses momentum. You might start to be able to hear them and respond to their heart rather than responding to their afflictions. Just that little moment of mindfulness in tandem with your understanding of emptiness releases the affliction. 
Have you had that, right? You had some version of that that maybe wasn't with emptiness, right? There was something about you thought something was one way and then you looked again and saw it wasn't and your emotion diffused. Something like that, right? Could be as simple as you were walking by shop windows and you thought your reflection was another person and you got startled and you did a double take and then you saw it was yourself and you were like, oh, never mind. Right. Just that recognition was enough for you to release your whatever self-consciousness of being observed, whatever it was. But the idea that the re remedy is released in its own place is saying that your mind created the problem and your mind creates the solution. What you need to do is train how your mind views things. And sometimes you don't need any other antidote. If you're having attachment arise, you're going to the supermarket and you're seeing your favorite food is on sale and it's something that's not good for you and your doctor told you to avoid it and your cravings are rising and you're thinking, no, but it's so delicious. Just this once isn't going to kill me. Just this once. It's a little treat. I deserve a treat. Life is hard. You're going for it. You're taking it. You're putting it in the basket and you put it in the basket and you're walking up to the checkout counter and you look at the cashier and you see that their teeth are all rotten from eating sweets. And then you realize I am also buying the same sweets that will rot my teeth. And you make some sort of like, oh, cause and effect. You might just sort of take it out of the basket and move on. There was some recognition that happened, right? <laughs> this equals that. And you already kind of knew, but the penny dropped. And so you didn't have to tell yourself a whole long story, you just took it out of the basket, put it back on the shelf. Yeah. And this is the way we want to get with our mindfulness is that our mindfulness carries with it this wisdom, either method or wisdom, but wisdom is much quicker if you can get a handle on it. So how do you exist from the perspective of emptiness? This is really the heart of it. Who are you? You're an illusion to yourself. That's a bit confronting. Are you there? Yes, you're there. Don't worry. But how do you exist? What is this idea of no self? This is very important. So you sit and you think, all right, who am I? Where am I? I am, you think of your name. I am sitting. Really? Where? Who? Are you your body? Are you your body? Well, say, let's let's pretend you are your body, even though we don't agree with that. You are sitting. What is sitting? Your legs are sitting. And your, you know, your bum is sitting. Are you sitting? No, just those parts. And you're like, okay, what exactly is sitting? Oh, just this, these parts of my hip bones and whatever. And then where? And then where? And then where? And anytime you search, it dissolves into parts, which dissolve into parts which dissolve into parts. And from a distance, you can label, but the closer in you zoom, the less you find that whole. Yeah, we say the whole is the sum of the parts. Yeah, we say this colloquially in society. We would say the whole is labeled on the parts, but there is nothing more than that label. Yeah, and when you start thinking of life that way, it again frees up some space. So we, let's just do a short reflection, short meditation, and then let's see how it lands after we've sat with it. So we're going to do a very gentle emptiness meditation and then see. <laughs> okay, so nice straight back. And if you want to take a few breaths, deep intentional breaths just to se settle into the space or do a little fidget or a little stretch. Just make yourself at home in your own body. And think that the reason I'm doing this meditative analysis is in order to cut the root of all my problematic patterns so that I stop creating suffering for myself and others. 
In other words, this meditation is to break the wheel of samsara. And in doing that, may I go on to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And with that motivation, try and think of a time where your sense of me, I, self, was very strong and vivid. A time when you were maybe hated or celebrated. When there was a lot of attention on you and you really felt the self rise. Maybe just the feeling you have if you almost fall down the stairs or if something scary happens in traffic. Just try and find that sense of strong I, self. That one that seems to have existed your whole life, gathering experiences to it, but having some sort of solid core. That one that narrates your experience to yourself. That one that feels like the victim or the hero or the ignored. The one you spotlight. This one, this self, really does seem to inherently exist. It seems to exist in and of itself. An independent little entity And this feeling of core self, permanent self, this is the one that feels like it needs support, that needs protection, that wants to be validated. This one doesn't see the interdependence of things. But this is the only self we've ever known. And on top of that feeling of just me, our other layers of identity, maybe our nationality, maybe our gender, maybe our generation, maybe our education, Maybe traits like being funny or being generous. These all get piled onto this feeling of this is me, this is who I am. And so just sit in that sense of your own self without challenging it too much at first. And so without challenging it yet, very gently explore that if this self existed in the way that it appears to, it would either be the same as its parts or different than its parts. 
parts being body, mind, etc. Just consider if this self does exist the way it seems to. Then its relationship to its parts is either the same with or different. One with or separate from. Just kind of explore that logic without going any further. I am the same as my body and mind, or I own my body and mind and I'm something different. It's one of those two. And so look at the first one. I might be one with my parts, the same as my parts, which means I or self is body, is mind. Does that seem like the case? That I am one with my parts? Am I my own name together with arm, together with leg, with left nostril? If you chop off a piece of my body, have you chopped off a piece of me? What if it's a fingernail? What if you lost a tooth? Are you gone? Is part of you gone? If the self is one with, same, merged with its parts, then cutting off your fingernails would be cutting off parts of self. You get your appendix out, part of you is gone. And so that feels a bit absurd. So maybe it's the mind. Maybe self is one with or the same as the mind. So what is the mind? Maybe it's the experiencer. Maybe it's the feelings, sensations, moods, different states of mind. And as you start to look, you notice that mind itself has many parts, is changing all the time, has different functions and characteristics. And if the self was one with all of those, it would be as if there were multiple selves. The self of feeling, the self of discernment. would be like everything happening with your mind would be a herd of horses going generally the same direction, but all also independent enough to break off and go somewhere else completely, find a home somewhere else. 
each of your mental factors would have some kind of autonomy. Maybe wouldn't even have to influence each other. And so that's absurd. And so the self must not be one with the parts. It mustn't be same. Not the same as the parts. So then if the self inherently exists as it seems to, then the only other possibility is that it's different to the parts, separate from them. And so look for that. A self that is not body, a self that is not mind, self like a puppeteer directing those. Looking for that. Independent, permanent little entity that tells the body and mind what to do while itself staying the same. Is there one? Maybe it feels like the self is the conductor and the body and mind are the orchestra. If that's the case, you should be able to find the conductor. Something that is not body, not mind, but additional. The boss or the hub. And so feeling that that also is absurd, that anything in charge or directing is just a mental factor interacting with other mental factors. They take turns being prominent or the boss in some ways, but are constantly interacting with the past, with the present, with the environment, various stimuli. And so the self can't be different to the parts, separate from. The self isn't one and it isn't many. And so an inherently existent self must be impossible. There is a body we got from the sperm and egg of our parents, the various nourishments it's had, the elements, there's a mind changing from moment to moment, an unbroken continuity, 
changing like a river. Having different influences and interactions. Changing course here and there. And this body and this mind are the basis that we label self. But there is nothing more than that. No extra self containing body and mind or being contained by body and mind. The self is only that which is labeled on the collection of parts. And then dedicate the energy of this meditation to understanding the ultimate truth of self, others, phenomena, in order to cut the root of samsara, the root of suffering and disturbing emotions, and in order to develop this mind to its utmost extent, to be completely enlightened for the welfare of all. You can relax your attention. Everybody's still there, merely labeled by the mind, on the valid basis. Yes. <laughs> did, uh, what what happened? How did it go? I found it raised more questions for me. Um, Good. Like, what is it then that's doing the observing and how do I have the awareness if I'm not the aggregation of all these things, then there still seems to be something there that's that's capable of, of seeing this. And so it's raised more questions. Yeah, good, good. And, uh, you know, many of those questions on the surface at least get answered by the teachings on minds and mental factors. Um, you know, there is cognition, right? There is experience. There is that. But that is not self. And that is not inherently existent. Yeah. So you can be, you know, processing, thinking, whatever. But but even just to think I own my own thoughts or I'm in charge of my own thoughts, that feels like a reasonable thing to say. And yet, who is making these thoughts? How do thoughts come about? There's all sorts of physical things happening. There's all sorts of things that just happen. There's the stimuli happening in this moment. And there's how you are conditioned to view that stimuli. And all of these causes and conditions come together for a thought. And then you feel like you're in charge of it. Mm. You know, and yet there is intention. There is choice. There is decisions. But all of those come about interdependently and yet feel completely independent mm -hmm. i did it myself i chose it myself i concluded myself i made this decision by myself when nothing has ever been done by yourself mm. you know yeah logically i can follow it and i can get it but there's still um the sense of well even if i if i have the thought this is impermanent this doesn't inherently exist where does that thought come from you know it's like um, so I can I'm getting a deeper appreciation of the layers mm. and the complexities of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, keep 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 the deep dive going. <laughs> keep yeah. finding the non finding. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What other thoughts came up for people? Well, I I had it. I had a sense of homelessness. Hmm. 
happy homelessness or scared lo- homelessness? <laughs> um, uh, neutral, but just homelessness. So when all of this doesn't exist, where am I? Where do I live? Where is my home? You know, so that yeah. shows me that I'm so attached to habits, to certain things, you know, and that I'm colluding with things, et cetera, et cetera. But that was really like a profound sort of, oh my God, I'm, you know, not I am homeless, but I had a sense of homelessness. Yeah. And it, it's, if there's a little bit of fear or a little bit of that homeless feeling, it's going the right direction because your ego is feeling the threat. You know, so it's a good sign if you have a bit of a wobble or a bit of a wait, where am I? Who am I? Is good. Um, you know, as long as it doesn't lead to like depersonalization and dissociation and all those things, but they wouldn't for you. I, I, I think that you're what that that one that feels homeless is the object of negation. That one. The very one that feels homeless is the one that has never existed at all. There is a self, but it's not that one. That's the pretender. You found the little sucker. You found him, which is he's so hard to find, right? Like that's what I spent, right? You know, I mean, that's why I spend so much time in the beginning of like try and get the self to arise. Think of being hated or celebrated or under threat, whatever it is that makes the eye amplified enough for you to catch it and see that that one's the pretender. Because when we're sitting quietly unconfronted, the self doesn't feel like such a problem, you know, and it doesn't feel like it's causing trouble. It just feels like, yeah, just me, you know, interdependent me, sure. But, you know, it feels like, what's the big deal? And then remember the last time you were reactive yeah. and how how loud the self gets when your buttons get pushed and how loud the self gets when you feel under threat, you know, and that one is the pretender. That one has never existed at all ever and is who we think we are. Who we really are is merely labeled on the collection of parts, all of which are interdependent and change moment to moment. But they're there, it's fine, no worries. But we always feel more extra. There's this whole extra like ride along passenger you know, hanging out in the center of our body or hanging out in our forehead, like a little transformer robot guy, like directing things, you know, it feels like there's this extra guy who, I don't know, somehow is in charge. And yet if he's in charge, he's doing a terrible job. He needs to be fired, you know, (laughs) right. I think it's wanting the security as, you know, otherwise we fall and you go, oh my God, you know, where am I going? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I I always think it's interesting how they emphasize um, stepping forth into the homeless life is one of the best ways to engage with the spiritual practice. It's not the only way, but that voluntarily being homeless makes you start to feel homeful, right? You start with this homeless, like complete, like, I have nowhere to land. I have nowhere to feel secure. I have nowhere to put my bag, to lay my head, to feel is home. But when you do it voluntarily, not because of deprivation or poverty or hardship, but when you do it voluntarily, it's still scary. But after a few months, weeks, years, you start to feel at home anywhere because you realize interconnection and and that home itself being a place of security is an illusion it's no more or less secure than anywhere else and and that all leads you to an understanding of ultimate truth if you let it and you don't even have to be homeless to do that you can just use your imagination you know and uh (laughs) save money because you know traveling is (laughs) expensive (laughs) thank you yeah. Yeah. What What other thoughts came up? Yeah, I want to say, um, my, I, I, my nose started running and suddenly I noticed how everything came together for me to wipe that nose. But at that moment, I didn't sense anyone directing. It all yeah. just came out naturally. I thought, oh, dependence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like it, things happen. Yeah. You know, it's not like negating that things happen, but who is making them happen is not so coarse. And also to say this is happening 
as opposed to a million other movements in time and space, you start to realize you're the one that drew the frame. Yeah, or you're the one that that made the spotlight happen. The projector is part of the problem. You know, I, I often think of, you know, the modern art movements that um, were taking a lot of photographs of like ugly places, you know, like a a dumpster inside a dumpster. And if you frame it beautifully and use really interesting lighting and then put it on canvas and put it in a gallery, suddenly the dumpster looks beautiful, you know, <laughs> because of the artistic rendering. It's like, well, if you put a frame around it and tell some tell people this is what it is, they start to believe it. And we're sort of forever putting frames around different parts of our experience and saying, this is significant. This is not significant. This is important. This is problematic. And we're the one making the frame and putting the little label under it. But it feels like it's self-existent or evident from its own side. Like the dumpster is telling us that it's art rather than we're telling it that it could be art. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's like wiping nose happened. But why is it more significant than scratching ear? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, so it's also recognizing that when you unpack the self, you unpack the way you observe the experiences of the self. And if you can do that, you're so much less reactive, you know, and you're so much less obnoxious about your opinions. You just have opinions, but you hold them lightly, knowing that they are interdependently arisen mm. you know and what I love so much is when Lama Zopa Rinpoche describes the way we come to understand the letter a some of you know this one you know it's like when you look at a letter a as an adult person who's been reading their whole life it seems to jump off the page you know like like those lines are telling you that it's a and you forget that when you were a little child, someone had to explain to you this line with this line with this line is an A. And you looked at it this direction again and again saying, oh, that's an A. A is for Apple. A sounds like this. And you did it so many times from this direction that now it feels like it's telling you it from that direction. Yeah, it feels like those lines are telling you that they're A when you're telling those lines that they're A. There are lines, yeah, yeah, but they're not A from their side. We told them that, yeah. right? Just like people, you know, they're not bad or good from their side. We're telling them that. And we might be telling them that based on a type of logic that functions in the world. It is useful to know the letter A. But if we think it's inherently the letter A, that's where it becomes a problem. If we think they're inherently a bad person, that's where it becomes a problem. And the deeper problem is that that is our default setting, is the assumption of inherence, the appearance of inherence. We have to consciously negate that because it's how we're naturally wired is with that fundamental ignorance. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep thinking, I am the projector, the project id isn't telling me, any, me anything from its side. I have told it what it is. And now it's bouncing back at me. And it becomes, you know, kind of a feedback loop. And survival wise, let it be, you know, like there's a dingo, you're camping, save the baby. Yeah, don't overthink it. <laughs> right? right, but you know, when it's like opinions about humans, when it's about things happening in your life that seem disruptive, like unpack it a little, you know, and say, okay, because of my conditioning and my history and my karma and my suffering and my grasping itself and my self grasping, and, you know, all of this stuff boils down to me thinking this is the story happening right now. And it makes sense that I feel that way, but that it doesn't mean that that is how it is. It might be one way of how it is, but there's this much more I could still hold in my gaze and would soften the edges. And if I can do that, I will be less angry, attached, jealous, proud, etc. So the relationship between understanding reality and having fewer negative states of mind and making fewer mistakes, there is a direct correlation there that we need to really workshop. So, okay, so I thought to just bring up the commentary where it says, consider all dharmas as like dreams. 
It says, as this indicates, the whole environment and the beings within it, which we perceive as objects, are dreamlike. That is to say, they appear as they do because of our own minds are diluted and not as the result of even a slightest factor aside from mind. We must therefore put a stop to our projections. So then we might wonder whether the mind itself is real. So the text says, examine the nature of unborn awareness. Mind itself is empty of the three stages of arising, remaining, and ceasing. It has no color, no shape, and so on. It does not abide outside or within the body. It has no fixed character at all and cannot therefore be apprehended in any way. Rest in an experience beyond thought. And as you do, if any thought of an antidote, such as considering that body and mind are empty, should arise, then the root text says, let even the antidote be freed in its own place. And this means that we look into the essence of the antidote itself. And when we realize that it has no true nature, we rest with that experience. As for how to rest, the root text says, rest in the alaya, the essence of the paths. So avoiding all the projection and absorption associated with the other seven types of consciousness, we must settle with lucid clarity in an experience that is beyond thought. We must not mentally fixate in any way what has no fixed character at all. So when we hear teachings like this, people think it means don't have thoughts, right? To go beyond thoughts means don't have thoughts. When actually what you need is very specific thoughts and then to let it rest. So what you wanted to be able to do is the analysis like we did, which is called the analysis of the four keys. That's what we did. It has a real name. You can find it in lots of different locations. It's not just a random yuntinism, okay? It's called the four keys. And when you do the meditation on the four keys, at the end of which you have that kind of feeling of ambiguity, the finding, the non-finding, like where is the self? Maybe it's spacious, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but I actually am really not so sure as I was in the beginning. There's a spaciousness. And what you need is that analysis to be the catalyst for that spaciousness, and you rest there. But it's like resting in an active way, like when a car is idling and what you're looking at through the windscreen is like a beautiful, expansive ocean view, and you're just looking bright, aware, clear, but you're not talking to yourself about it. Yeah. Do you know that feeling like in holiday mind where you're driving but not rushed and then you have to stop at a stoplight and what you're looking at is some beautiful expanse and you're just happy to look, but you're not thinking too many things, but you're not asleep and you're not spaced out. Do you know this, this kind of mind? Like use whatever example you like, but you're awake, you're alert, you're spacious, not spacey. And what we want is that type of meditative experience that's been informed by a correct analysis. So it's like you're just staying very open and spacious, conditioned by what you've understood to be true, but no longer talking to yourself about it. But you have to have talked to yourself about it at some point. Otherwise, you're just kind of like relaxing. <laughs> right? Which is nice, but it's not been conditioned by anything. Yeah, you've had the experience, but you've missed the meaning. It's, it's something interesting to explore. So when you're working with a meditation on the mind and a meditation on the ultimate nature of the mind, the emptiness of the mind, don't feel like you're emptying out your mind. Feel like you're turning down the volume of conceptualization in a natural way not forcing thoughts away, trying not to feed them or chase them. You just let them arise and dissolve without being interested in them. But you've done that after having analyzed reality. Do you have, do you have questions, thoughts?
So if you're going to do a meditation on emptiness, do a little analysis and then go to a little single pointedness. Yeah. And when you do an analysis, make sure you're using a, a valid source, walk yourself through the stages, make it personal, but really touch the headings, really, you know, use those formulas of the great scholar practitioners of the past. And then once you've had your analysis and you kind of come to that kind of spacious ambiguity, stay there. The really part of this is to feel that it's relevant and important to have these deep, deep thoughts about the nature of self, others, and reality. Why? Because your current way of thinking of self, others, and reality is problematic. Yeah, the opinions we come to lead to the negative states of mind that we have, lead to the fact that our mind is not 100% under our own control. If you're in a terrible mood, can you force yourself out of it? It sort of has to run its course. Can you prevent a negative state of mind? Sometimes, you know, we're not in the, the control of our mind that we could be. And the more we train our mind, the more access we have to happiness and to be positive and to be of benefit to others and to develop the incredible potential of our mind. Or we could just kind of let it go and just kind of try and be nice, polite people. And that that's good. It would be great if everyone did at least that. But would we really be using our human potential? You know, and on our deathbed, what are the things we'll treasure and value? Good relationships and connect heart connections. And what will we regret? The times that that wasn't the case. Yeah, the times that we hurt each other the times that we left things unreconciled, the times that trust was broken, you know, the times that we didn't pursue the deep thoughts and we let things live in superficial, worldly, materialistic, and we just kind of lost years of our life to that. You know, are you going to be on your deathbed wishing you had watched more episodes and reruns of crap TV? You know, gee, I wish I'd saw the golden girls one more time i mean you're not you know like you're not gonna think that i wish i'd watched a lot more reality television you know i really wish i had no <laughs> i wish i'd held more grudges i wish i'd been more cynical jaded and annoyed with people more often i wish i'd been more irritable i wish i'd been harder to live with no you know it's it's, it's really reverse engineer your life start at the end at the end, what do you want to be happy about? At the end, what do you want to not have as many regrets about? And then ask yourself, today what needs to change? Today what needs to be strengthened? And you don't have to find all the answers, all the deep philosophical points, but keeping your mind in the seeker's mind, in the mind that's curious, in the mind that's not so sure of yourself in a positive way. You know, it's like happy, confident curiosity, that learner student mind. And that mind comes from a deep confidence that you can recognize wisdom when you hear it. You know, you're not thinking I'm just kind of this passive recipient of wisdom that I come across. No, you have an inner guru that recognizes truth when you hear it, but you also have to come across things that will resonate with it. Progress can't be a passive thing. Evolution isn't linear and tidy. Yeah, reincarnation isn't a nice, tidy evolution that goes up and up and up and up. You can just as easily backslide and dung beetle yourself. And we have countless times. You know, so being proactive about your own evolution so that you don't waste the fact that you have a human life. And more than a human life, you have a human life with so much inner and outer support. You know, you've got solid intelligence. You've got enough physical and mental independence to access whatever you want. You live in a safe, beautiful country. And those things are actually rare. You just take them for granted because you're surrounded by other people with similar conditions. But, you know, just 
couple bad leaders in a row, couple bad natural disasters in a row, and there you are just trying to get through the day finding enough water. And who's got time for the spiritual path then? You know, or, you know, one fall down the stairs, you break your leg, break your hip, that's going to pull focus. You know, those simple things, they pull focus and understandably so. So it's it, it's in these rare moments of peace in your life, relative peace, you know, you've got relationship issues and financial worries and all sorts of stuff, which is relevant and absolutely deserves compassion. But there's a relative freedom that is a rare freedom. And so please use it, I guess, is my big invitation of the day. And <laughs> don't waste this precious life. And how wonderful it is that you would all come to a class and think about big ideas rather than just kind of go to a show or something. It's amazing because all of you are those seeker minds, but um, never give up and keep showing up and keep showing up to each other, keep showing up to teachings, keep showing up to books, keep showing up to your cushion, you know, and then at the end of your life, you'll think that was a good effort. <laughs> that was a good effort. All right. Next, let's do it again. Yeah. Oh, any any questions or comments? We can do a whole other section if you want quite quickly, but we don't need to squeeze it if you've got good questions and thoughts to share. I just feel like I've been at a birthday party all morning because I've had, you've given us so many goodies um, mm -hmm. to to work with and to think about um it's i just i feel energized and inspired thank you so much it's it's really uplifting thank you oh, i'm glad i'm glad yeah this text is a it's a gem this text mm -hmm. uh, Khalil, did you have something yeah thank you i came off mute to thank you as well and second that uh, uh, view um, I think after the meditation, there was a point about clarity and I uh, wanted to just check with you, is it uh, more about defining by saying what it is not versus what it is? Because I thought you were trying to really go down that path and just to understand is that a, a good way to approach, you know, basically the, the, the body, mind and the soul, if you want to call it that? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's like emptiness is a non-affirming negation. It doesn't imply anything in its place. And so not this, not this, not this. Very useful unless you get to nihilism. Then you've gone too far. <laughs> so it's like go right to the edge and then take a little step back. <laughs> right? Okay. Nihilism yeah. has gone too far. More normally we tend towards eternalism, you know, and we turn but sometimes some personalities tend towards nihilism and um so yeah don't go off the cliff <laughs> okay thank you that's yeah. good yeah it's valuable thanks thank you so much there's a there's a quote from lama chopa guru puja which some of you do um it's verse 108 and it says samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of inherent existence and cause and effect and dependent arising are infallible please bless me to understand the import of nagajuna's thought that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so the fact that things can be empty, but still function, things can lack inherent existence while ethics still apply. This razor's edge is the place to play and to really explore and to say, I can say something is ethical or unethical, something is good or bad. I can say that, but I have to say that lightly and gently, always with awareness of context and as soon as I think I've gotten the whole context, I need to remember there's always more context. And you keep your eye on the big picture and the picture keeps getting bigger. But in that picture getting bigger should feel like even more connections. You know, not more and more alone, not more and more confused, but more and more spacious, connected and held. So, you know, just kind of in that place of play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. like a life thing. It's a life thing. It's it can't yeah. be different. It's just a life thing. Yeah. Exactly. It's like palpable possibility. You know, this this possibilityness. Emptiness is possibilityness. You know, not just this sort of like random void of nothing. It's like the potential space from which things arise. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, keep, keep playing with it, but there's a very good book um, that's not beginners, not super technical advanced, kind of a nice intermediate level book that you guys, some of you will know, but it's called How to See Yourself as You Really Are. It's by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And it's all emptiness meditations, um, but they're broken up into nice chunks. So it'll be like a little explanation and then like a one page reflection and then another way of looking at it and a one page reflection. So it's a, it's a really good intermediate text on this topic. So if you're interested how to see yourself as you really are by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, it's a classic. It'll never go out of style. Yeah, I'll, let's see. I'll put the cover on the screen. There it is. There. Yay. Um, so it sounds like some sort of self-help book, but it actually goes into quite um, technical things. Yeah. And a particularly this se section, how to undermine ignorance and feeling the impact of interrelatedness. These ones is some real gems in there. Yeah. And uh, in terms of mind training, you know, at the beginning of the course, I gave you lots of different uh, recommended readings that you could go back to. But really, the one that is... I think my my home <laughs> for this particular text, honestly, has been um, a combination between super traditional and super modern. So we have Start Where You Are, Pema Chodron, and we have Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun, Nam Kapel. So Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun is super traditional, and I love it. And Start Where You Are is super modern, and I love it. So um, if you're wanting follow-ups on seven-point mind training, those are some goodies. And there's also, uh, yeah, like this. And then there's also In Praise of Great Compassion from that Library of Wisdom and Compassion series is really excellent um, with lots of different Lojong compilations. All right, well, if there's no questions, we can call it a day. And uh, please keep reading this text and thinking about it and talking to each other about it. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you. you so thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Venerable Yonton, on behalf of our, our Blue Mountains community and everyone that was, um, I think there's a few people from elsewhere. We thank you so much for this extraordinary um, um, teaching. And we wish you well and I uh, hope that you can come to Australia in uh, the new year. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll be I'll be briefly in Queensland in uh, July, but just Queensland briefly to see my teacher. So if anyone's in Queensland, send me an email. But otherwise, I'll plan to come to the Blue Mountains when I can, maybe in 2025. Well, that would be wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you.